I'd now like to begin today's web conference and introduce Julio Ferruzzi and Sarah Brown. I'd now like to begin today's web conference and introduce Julio Ferruzzi and Sarah Brown. Great, thank you, Melanie. Uh, so this all has come about um, because you all are signed up for a Western Fair sponsored training that um, is planned for. Um, a couple weeks from now in July. And um, a little bit of background, Julio and I both work out of the West Tech Center up in Portland. Um, and for quite a number of years, we've been providing uh, technical assistance related to organic. And um, just to give you an overview here of what we're going to talk about today, we're, I just want to give a brief a brief kind of update and some background on this specific project, uh, a little bit of an overview about the organic standards related to pest management, and Julia will talk about how NRCS practices um, can be used to support those. And then uh, just a brief list of some of the best resources that are out there related to pest management. So if you haven't had a chance to already, um, I'd encourage everyone to copy and paste the link that is in the notes um, into your browser to download and print out the brochure that we're basically going to be using as a guide for today's presentation. Um, it's also available from the um, webinar interface. If you go to links at the top of your screen, you can download the PDF there as well. So we'll be going through this brochure, and um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in at any time, and we'll take uh, verbal questions at the end. So a little bit of the project background. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, I was having conversations with the state agronomists in Idaho and California and Oregon um, and Nevada about uh, doing conservation planning on organic farms and what some of the challenges had been. And most of those states had all had some preliminary training related to what organic certification was and what the standards were. And what we were really hearing from the field was that, you know, it's, it's nice to know the standards, but we really need assistance in writing job specifications and um, writing the plans for, for these producers. And so, Working with NCAT ATRA and Rex Dufour based in California and Jennifer Miller from the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides, uh, we put together a Western Fair proposal to create some guidance documents or some implementation guides for installing NRCS practices um, on organic farms. And the way that we selected the practices to prioritize was through surveys that were sent out to field offices. So hopefully everyone who's joining us today had an opportunity to identify the key practices and priorities that they saw um, for, for assistance in working with organic producers. So Today, uh, we're responding to uh, the need for help with pest management on organic farms. It seems that there is a lot of confusion about how to use 595 and um, what some of the other alternative methods are for working with these producers to, um, to, to support pest management activities. So hopefully we'll be clarifying that for you all today. Uh, the other topics that we are addressing through this project are cover crops, nutrient management, uh, buffers, and uh, some general support and resources related to conservation planning with trans producers. So when you join us for the in-person training, we'll be able to cover those in more detail. All right, so just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I just wanted to give a very brief overview of what the NOP rules are related to pest management. And um, as most of you probably know, it's very much focused on prevention. So synthetic pesticides are generally prohibited. Um, the 
first rule and probably the most important for organic producers is that it's really not an input substitution um, standard. You can't go from using chemical pesticides to organic ones. Uh, you have to be able to demonstrate and document that you're using prevention practices first. And so that will include sanitation measures. Um, this is especially important for um, weed seeds. Uh, you, organic producers obviously don't have the herbicides to choose from that uh, conventional producers do. So that's something they'll be very careful about. Uh, growing healthy plants, using resistant varieties are all um, are all examples of prevention practices that uh, folks can utilize. And then there's mechanical, physical, and cultural techniques that producers can adopt as well, whether that's planting beneficial habitat, uh, using traps, mulching, mowing, grazing, cultivation, and flaming. In the photo at the bottom of this page, um, this was taken on an organic farm in Oregon that grows, I believe, about 15 acres of wholesale organic crops. And they've been working closely with Extension to incorporate pollinator plantings into their uh, into their crop rotation. And so in this photo, you'll see a picture of a broccoli field. And um, interspersed throughout the field are um, small groupings of flowering um, plants for habitat. And the way that they've incorporated that into their system is at the end of their plug trays when they're seeding out their broccoli for transplanting, they throw in a few um, a few seeds for, for pollinators. Um, and so it makes it very easy for their crew to, to place those out uh, in their field. So that's one easy technique. So once producers are able to document that they've done prevention and mechanical or um, cultural methods for control, they can then use inputs if the other practices have proved insufficient. And of course, those have to be um, approved for use in organic systems. And in relation to weed management, uh, this is actually, this text was taken directly from the NOP standards on on organic production. So uh, mulching is allowed, mowing, grazing, hand weeding is allowed, flaming, and um, mulches are allowed as well. So the one caveat with mulches, for synthetic mulches, they need to be removed from the field at the end of the growing or harvest season. And there is a bit of um, a gray area there as to how each certifier interprets the that phrase, the end of the growing or harvest season. So uh, for a crop like blueberries, that's a multi-year perennial crop, um, some certifiers might say the end of the harvest season is annually, and some certifiers might say it's multi-year. So uh, it's important for producers, um, if they're going to be working with a mulch standard and getting assistance from NRCS on that, it's very important that they know and are clear on how their certifier is interpreting that rule. So in these slides, there's a picture of a pepper field that's uh, grown using some plastic mulches. Uh, in the bottom slide, that's a photo of an Alice Chalmers G culti um, cultivating tractor. Uh, these were popular in the, I don't know, in the, the 40s and 50s before synthetic herbicides got really popular. And um, we actually have one of these on our farm at home, and um, it's a great tractor for um, for for cultivation because the implements are belly mounted so you can look down right below your seat and have very precise um, steering control and, and know exactly where the implements are in relation to your plants. Um, the implement that's attached in this photo is called a Lely tine weeder and they're very, very small tines and um, you set it very shallow in your soil so when the weeds are in like the white thread stage. And uh, this photo, it was actually a demonstration that a farmer was showing. They have popsicle sticks in the ground to um, be, they're kind of using them as an example of what the size of transplants might be. And they just drive right over them. And the tines just very, very gently kind of tickle the surface of the soil and knock any small weeds out. Um, and the transplants are able to withstand that. So this is great on the production side because it saves hours and hours of manual cultivation. Uh, but it's an example of uh, 
of a tool that can be used with that has relatively minimal soil disturbance. Um, and so it's it's a great option for some folks. So those are the organic standards that producers are forced to follow, and um, it's pretty minimal, as you can tell. Um, they're going to have to document all the practices and techniques they're using in their organic system plan, and they'll have to be having have pretty extensive records to, to document what they have and have not done. And so with that, um, we'd like to transition into talking about um, NRCS conservation practices and how they can be used to support organic producers that are following these rules. And so I am going to pass. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. And so at this point, we're going to be talking about uh, the the NRCS practices uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, get myself organized here. We're going to um, only focus on the uh, NRCS uh, practices um, that can directly or indirectly support IPM, that is the integrated pest management that people would use to manage their pests. Uh, and in terms of NRCS practices, we're only going to focus on the most relevant purposes in those practices um, that have been identified for use that can meet, that can support uh, IPM. So with that, we'll start with the first most obvious practice and probably the most um, difficult uh, practice to uh, understand and implement, and that is our uh, our 595 practice, which is also titled IPM. But when you look at the purposes, we quickly see that the the main purposes of our 595 is to prevent or mitigate uh, pesticide risk. And so those are the, th the three of the four purposes that we have here. And those are, those are relevant in terms of NRCS, what well, NRCS wants to do with the 595, and that is to prevent or mitigate pesticide risk to on-site or off-site resource concerns. And where that ties into integrated pest management in the classical sense is that uh, the first purpose obviously looks at water quality, and therefore uh, it, it can be used to protect off-site uh, ground nesting bee habitat. The second purpose um, of the standard can actually be used to protect off-site beneficial insects because it focuses on pesticide losses uh, from drift and volatilization. And the last uh, purpose up there is looking at on-site pesticide risk. So we're looking at uh, uh, changing the way that people use certain uh, pesticides, you know, either in timing of application or, or how they apply it, so that the impacts to beneficial insects, such as pollinators, are minimized. But the biggest issue with our 595 standard is that we should realize that the NRCS 595 standard is not used to actually manage pests. It's solely used to prevent or mitigate hazards of the pesticide suppression or the pesticide or pest suppression techniques. And so we're either trying to prevent or mitigate. It's not just a way to pay people to manage bugs or weeds. Uh, we, we look at, when we look at the actual standard, there is in the general criteria a requirement to use land-grant university IPM systems uh, or guidelines. And we do require that that is the case, that if there is an IPM system for that particular commodity that the client is using, we expect our client to be following that, but again, the purpose for implementing the 595 is not solely to get them to adopt an IPM system, but to actually address a resource concern that we have identified. 
Uh, it would seem then that in organic systems, uh, because many of the organic materials that are that are used to suppress um, pests in, in organic systems, you would think are not as toxic as, as some of the synthetics, that there may not be opportunity to use 595, but that is not the case. There are some materials that uh, do tend to be uh, toxic. There are some materials that are actually some common materials like pyganic that uh, are uh, relatively toxic to fish. And so if you're in a situation where runoff might make it to a fish bearing stream uh, in an organic farm and they're using pyganic, there might be opportunity to use uh, 595. The next practice that uh, we'll talk about here is nutrient management. And the two main purposes, NRCS purposes, for implementing nutrient management that apply here in terms of uh, managing pests are to budget, supply, and conserve nutrients for plant production, and uh, to manage or improve the physical, chemical, or biological condition of the soil. And so the first purpose in is plant focused in trying to make sure that the manner in which we apply those nutrients produce a, a healthy plant. For In terms of uh, pest management, what that means is that if you have a, a healthy plant, that plant is going to be able to um, outcompete weeds potentially and also be more resistant to uh, insect pests and possibly diseases. So there's the advantage of that. And the second purpose when we're looking at healthy soils, we really are looking at focusing the, the ability to provide a conducive environment, soil environment, that the plants can grow quickly and well in and have a higher ability to tolerate pest pressures. And we also see that, uh, you know, one of the one of the main factors in um, looking at uh, soil condition is the uh, is higher organic matter content in soils, which can have um, a huge benefit, of course, in uh, in providing uh, the plants with nutrients over time. Cover cropping is our next practice, and there are several purposes for cover cropping. And the, the first purpose that we would implement a cover crop for NRCS purposes would be to increase soil organic matter content. And as we discussed just uh, previously with, um, the, with the 590 standard, the nutrient management standard, is that's a, an, a huge benefit in organic systems because the organic matter per not only provides a uh, ecosystem for the microbes to live in, but also food source and also nutrient source to the plants as those bugs break that organic matter down. And so they're releasing nutrients. We also use cover crop to increase biodiversity in a rotation. And when we do so, if, if we select the correct types of cover crops, we can also be providing habitat uh, for beneficial and predatory insects in the organic system. And so if you have a cover crop field next to your production field, uh, you can have beneficial insects and pollinators um, hiding out in there and, and uh, visiting your crop, and so therefore providing a much more holistic system. Um, and also, the increase in biodiversity that a cover crop provides can also break uh, pest cycles in the rotation. And the last, the last um, purpose that we have listed, NRCS purpose, that's called uh, suppressing weeds, is uh, is that you know you asked why why is that an NRCS purpose? Well. It's, it's a purpose because 
we had, we know that certain cover crops are good at competing, uh, out competing weeds. And if you throw those cover crops in, um, they can do a couple of different things. One is, is they can uh, directly compete, uh, and maybe as you turn that, as you mulch that cover crop into the ground uh, before you plant your your next crop, you can have some allelopathic effects so that it prevents weeds from germinating in your next crop. But also, an advantage in terms of organic systems is that you can use these uh, cover crops to actually smother out uh, some weeds. In, in uh, I believe in the Salinas Valley, there's been extensive work done with uh, mustard cover crops and their ability to actually germinate and, and then kill uh, some um, certain weeds that are a problem in lettuce fields. I, I believe um, I believe they've been very effective at that. And, and so the NRCS aspect of that is, you know, if you, if you can plant a cover crop and minimize the amount of weeds that come up, the system itself is better because there's going to be less effort in uh, trying in, in suppressing weeds in other ways, such as chemical or mechanical. And so if you can use a cover crop to do that weed suppression rather than chemicals or tillage, that's going to be better for the system. And that's that's sort of the, the NRCS advantage there. The next practice, or the next, uh, yeah, the next practice is uh, mulching. Actually, yeah, the next, before I move on to mulching, I, I do want to just mention that, you know, there, there are a number of cover crops for all sorts of reasons, and uh, before, before anyone should make a decision of which cover crop is right for them. They really need to research it, and there are there are many um, publications out there. You should look at something that is applicable for your location. Uh, but there are some uh, examples, good examples in um, crop rotations on organic farms, a planting manual by uh, Moeller and others. It's about 2009 publication, and in there they have lots of different examples of how you go about selecting the correct cover crop for your rotation and what advantages a particular cover crop might have for your for your actual crop. Uh, just some examples. Brassicas are, are great at uh, suppressing uh, root rot of peas, um, but you also have to look at some of the the you know rye suppresses black root rot, but you also have to look at some of the disadvantages and that is even though cover crops can provide benefits, they can also have some drawbacks. So hairy vetch, for example, is a good host for a northern root rot nematode. And so if you have northern root rot nematode as a problem, uh, you might want to make sure that you do not uh, plant hairy vetch before the, the crop that, that's a problem for. All right, let's move on to mulching. So. As Sarah described earlier um, in, the, in the slide with the uh, plastic mulch, that mulching can be used in organic systems. Um, in RCS, we use it for many reasons. Uh, two of those reasons we see here, to improve soil health and to suppress wheat growth. When you're using it to improve soil health, we're really looking at some of the natural materials and to do to make sure that we maximize those benefits, we're really looking at the water improve the you know water retaining uh, abilities of mulch. So you're not going to dry out the soil as much if you have a nice thick layer of mulch on the surface. It also reduces splashing from irrigation systems and rain. And in, in terms of uh, organic systems. The benefit there is huge because sometimes a lot of the uh, the, the uh, soilborne diseases that can splash up 
onto a plant and start infecting it can be reduced with a good layer of mulch. Um, but mulches can also be a habitat for um, predatory insects. And they can also be um, habitat for not just the, uh, the predatory insects, but also they can be habitat for pests and diseases. So you have to be careful about what you're using and, and choose the correct mulch uh, so that you don't actually create more habitat for the bad bugs. And depending on which type of materials you use, the reflective mulches can, can also have some advantages. Regardless of what type of mulch you use, the goal here in NRCS purposes is to improve soil health. And so in terms of how that translates to organic systems, you need to make sure that you have that, the right materials that can provide those IPM benefits in either providing habitat for beneficials or disallowing habitat for diseases and, and other uh, bad bugs. And of course, the, the most obvious reason for why we mulch most of the time in, at NRCS uh, in some of the plantings that we do is to suppress weed growth. So when we're mulching around shrubs and trees, we do that to you know, increase um, uh, water efficiency, but also to keep the weeds from coming in. And so weed suppression is, is uh, not uncommon for us to use mulching standard. And if we can get a good, thick, natural mulch on that surface, um, and it does need to be thick so that it prevents uh, the, the weed seeds from germinating in that surface, that's what we're shooting for. Or if you're going to be using uh, synthetic materials, like Sarah said earlier, we need to, the, the organic systems need to make sure that they uh, remove it at the end of the season or at the end of harvest. Conservation crop rotation. Here we have a very broad practice standard that, that uh, pretty much we can do a lot of things with. And uh, when you look at the NRCS main purposes that, that, we, that are applicable to IPM here, we, look, we see that, again, we're, we're mentioning some of the things we've seen before to improve soil quality and manage the balance of plant nutrients, which is some of the same benefits that we've seen uh, with the 590 standard. And so we're really trying to essentially put a rotation together that, uh, that builds healthy soils but also breaks pest cycles. And we see that with, um, with some of the other, uh, with, with the last standard, of, or the last purpose, uh, where it says uh, manage, pest, manage plant pests and that is weeds, insects, and diseases, by putting together the correct crop rotation, we can actually break pest cycles so that uh, we don't provide uh, overwintering habitat, nor do we provide uh, another crop for our pests to continue in the next year. But we can also use conservation crop rotation to provide food and cover for wildlife, which includes pollinators. Uh, and in this case, this is really the uh, IPN benefit of, of the correct uh, conservation crop rotation, and that is to provide um, the, uh, the habitat for predatory insects and also um, ground nesting, or ground dwelling insects, uh, beetle, beetles and, and uh, other uh, smaller in invertebrates and maybe vertebrates like uh, mice and snakes that can actually provide some control of the, uh, of the bad bugs. So if we're putting in our conservation crop rotation the right crops that can, that can provide support for the beneficials, that's a, that's a great um, IPM support for organic systems.
then lastly, we have residue and tillage management. And the, these uh, residue and tillage management standards in general, there's going to be, right now, I, I think there are four standards. And we're proposing, um, the new drafts are proposing two standards. Uh, the no-till standard of 329 and a reduced tillage standard of 345. But there's a warning here with um, reduced tillage standards, and that is inorganic systems, as you saw um, at the beginning of the presentation, Sarah mentioned that when it comes to managing weeds, uh, organic systems really don't have a lot of herbicides that are at their disposal. So a lot of the control for weeds comes with the uh, prevention and avoidance techniques that are used and, of course, the, the tillage, the cultural, uh, cultural pest suppression techniques, which is typically tillage in an organic system. So if you remove tillage from your toolbox, you really don't have a lot to work with. So even though um, these standards can be used with, with some limitations in organic systems, uh, they really do uh, tie the hands of the organic producer in terms of uh, weed management. So they can be used, but they do sometimes have some mixed results. For example, in the Northwest, one of the biggest problems with some of these uh, uh, no-till uh, attempts is that they harbor, I mean, their slug habitat. And slugs and snails can, can do quite a number on um, transplants and, and new seedlings. And so you have to make sure that uh, your crop can actually uh, is, is actually uh, amenable to uh, no-till. Uh, but it can provide, on the other hand, no-till or strip-till can provide enough soil cover, enough mulch on the surface to prevent weeds from germinating also. So there, there is a potential for this practice in organic systems, but albeit limited, I believe, and it really needs to be worked out on a location by location, rotation by rotation basis to see where these particular NRCS practice standards can actually be beneficial in organic system IPM. And at that, I'm going to turn it over, turn it back over to Sarah, and she will Great, thanks, Julio. So just a couple last um, things we wanted to go over. So we've gone through some of the NRCS practices that you can use, and then some additional considerations. Uh, I, I assume most of you are familiar with the general concepts of biological control. So increasing habitat on the farm to host beneficial insects um, is likely a priority for most organic farmers. And you could probably spend a whole day, if not more, talking about this subject. Um, but we wanted to identify some of the more commonly used NRCS practices to support this and just a few considerations. So uh, thorough site prep and maintenance is crucial in organic systems because um, you have less tools for maintenance um, further down the line. And um, this uh, this topic we'll definitely be able to get into more detail to in the in-person trainings in a couple weeks. Um, but just as the example I showed earlier with the plantings interspersed through the broccoli field, there's many ways to be creative um, and provide the habitat on the farm. Um, you want to have a diversity of plants to extend your bloom period and um, and sources for a variety of different insects for food and habitat. And then I just wanted to also point out the pollinator habitat assessment guide that Xerces has put together. It's a very helpful um, tool that has a number of photographs to help planners identify um, habitat that might be on the farm or areas where it might be appropriate to include. 
so just a couple photos of beetle banks. Beetle banks are a way to provide habitat for ground dwelling um, predatory insects and uh, the research that's been done has shown that um, they do have impacts further out into the field. So it's a more unusual way to um, uh, increase habitat on a farm. And there's, you know, again, much more information about this. This is just an introduction to the idea. And uh, just to reiterate, so buffers, the organic, um, the NLP requirement for buffers is really an opportunity for conservation. So um, rather than just have a blank roadway or mode area, um, there's a big opportunity to increase habitat. I and mean, there's many different ways to do that, whether it's just a, a flowering meadow or an actual um, hedgerow. And then uh, pesticide drift, so in organic systems, uh, you're not really as concerned about pesticide use on the farm, but you're certainly concerned about pesticides from off-farm coming onto the farm and causing issues. So um, there is a rule about buffer zones, uh, and there are a number of different NRCS practices that can help intercept that drift. And so. Um, those are listed here at the top, and then this is just a visual, visual example of why an organic system having some sort of buffer area is important so that organic crops are not contaminated. And so a couple resources that we did want to share. Uh, eOrganic, if you're not familiar with that, is part of the eExtension community online, and uh, they have they're one of my favorite places to go to for any questions I have related to organic production or cropping systems, including livestock systems. Uh, they have a number of archived webinars on everything from fly management and organic dairies to grafting organic uh, greenhouse tomatoes. So um, they have some great specific information. Uh, they have the webinars and then all the uh, documents and publications on the website have been reviewed uh, to make sure they are consistent with the organic re regulations and uh, to make sure that they are um, of sufficient quality to be supported by extension. So they have a whole page on cover cropping uh, with lots more information on types, seeds and sourcing, uh, video clips, and all sorts of great stuff. And then the book that Julio mentioned, Crop Rotations on Organic Farms, a planning manual, uh, is available for download online. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, it, it not only covers crop rotations for pest and weed management, but it includes information on crop rotations nutrient management, and I failed to include here, but we actually have Charles Moeller, one of the main authors, he will be presenting an NRCS webinar um, in the organic webinar series that we host on August 6th, and that will be available through conservationwebinars.net, um, and if you're interested in that, please feel free to email me if you don't currently have that information. I've seen the presentation and it looks like it will be just as good as the book. So I would encourage folks to join us for that. And uh, the last document here is in draft stage and we will have that available at the in-person training, uh, but that is the conservation buffers document that we're working on as part of this Western SARE project that goes into much more detail on uh, how to install and maintain buffers in organic systems. So with that, um, we can open the line for verbal questions. It doesn't look like we've had, had any come in um, through the notes page, but this is a relatively small group today, and um, we'd encourage folks to to ask any questions you might have to clarify um, how we can support organic farmers with their pest management goals while also um, supporting uh, conservation and natural resource management on their farms. So thank you for joining us and uh, we are open to take any questions you might have. Just a quick reminder to the audience, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, please dial star one on your phone and you will be notified when your line is unmuted so that you can ask your question. And you can also type your questions into the notes tab or by using the send note button. Please send them to all moderators. All 
All right. So, Julio, I'm going to direct this to you. It looks like it, it might have come to me only. Uh, we have a question that was written in saying, how can UC Davis ITM guides help with the 595 practice? That's an excellent question. So the UC Davis IPM guides are essentially a way to document that the that our client is actually meeting the minimum criteria, the general criteria of a 595. In the 595, we ask that uh, our clients follow the land grant university. IPM system for their commodity, and the, the UC IPM guidelines are exactly that. And in addition to the guidelines, UC, the UC Davis guidelines typically have what's called a checklist that is essentially a summary, typically like a two to, two to four page summary of all the IPM techniques during the entire season for that particular commodity, and all the things that 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 they could or should be doing. And if a client came in with that checklist with all the appropriate things that they're doing checked off, that's a very neat and, and tidy way for an RCS person to, to just document that the client has met the general criteria. On top of that, some of those items that are listed in the guidelines can actually uh, potentially be some of the mitigation techniques. Uh, but it, you know, without seeing the, the actual guideline, I, I can't say for sure. They don't all go into that detail. Some of them do. Good question. Another question that I commonly get um, is what if uh, a planner has contracted 595 for an organic system where they are not spraying? What what should what should they do at this point, Julio? Do you have any insight into that? Well, that's a that's a program question, um, and it really depends also on the year in which that was contracted and remember that the the year in which you write that contract is the year of, of the is the same year in which the standard that you're using is. So if this was an older contract with the older five nine five standard, um, you know, that had a very different purpose. The new five nine five standard that's been out for a while, the those were the purposes that we discussed. So it really depends on the, the the year of when the contract was written and what 595, what version of the 595 was uh, was that client going to be held to. Uh, if you know exactly what to do if if someone realizes that with a new contract the 595 was you know was planned was ill planned that's I'm going to defer that to the program folks as to what they what they prefer to do in their states. Great. So we have another question that's come in that's actually a, a, one that I commonly hear, and that is that um, some planners um, have the perception that organic growers are already doing cover crops, they're already doing crop rotations, they're already doing nutrient management. Uh, so there's nothing NRCS can really help them with. And I do hear that quite a bit because if organic growers are following the National Organic Program standards, there is quite a bit that they should already be doing. But when you compare the requirements of the organic standards to the requirements of NRCS, there's a big difference in what nutrient management looks like for the National Organic Program um, and what NRCS expects if you are contracted for uh, the 590. So, um, again, there's a program element to this question because EQIP is used to contract new things on a farm. Um, and maybe we could discuss this more at the in-person trainings when we have some of the state staff available for um, clarification. But if 
my what I have heard is that if a practice is being used to meet a, per, a new purpose on the farm, or if um, an organic grower has been, you know, doing what they call nutrient management or cover cropping to meet the organic standards, and it's not the same as what nutrient management or cover cropping would be according to NRCS, then there might still be an opportunity to work with them. So um, that would be a great question to discuss more in person with some of the state folks, but thank you for bringing that up. Yes, yes, and I, I think you make a very good point, Sarah, about the fact that it really all goes back to the criteria and the standard, and, and you have to really, as a planner, not just ask if someone's cover cropping, but ask how they're cover cropping and compare that to the criteria in our standard. And if they're not meeting our criteria, then they're not doing what our standard says. And so there's, you know, you can you can say, well, you're not actually cover cropping according to our standard, and therefore you are eligible to adopt our criteria. And so, uh, yes, there's there's always opportunity. And one, the biggest opportunity, I think, is the fact that uh, NRCS brings to the table the ability to evaluate systems in a way that uh, organic system that the certifiers cannot. So in terms of soil loss and um, soil quality, we do have tools that can help us uh, basically quantify the amount of soil loss or or qualify the, you know, whether or not the system is actually improving organic matter or not. And that's something that uh, certifiers do not typically have or use. All right. I haven't seen any other questions come in through the notes. Were there any other um, folks that had things they were wondering about? All right. Well, uh, we will have the opportunity to follow up more. And um, if uh, I would encourage everyone to, again, print out this document and take the time to really look it over before our in-person training so that um, if you do have any questions or concerns, we can discuss it more in person. And uh, because pest management is so broad and relates to so many uh, systems on a farm, uh, we wanted to make sure people had time to really let this sink in um, before we get into more specific topics like cover cropping and, and buffers. So thank you for joining us today. And um, this webinar, again, will be recorded and made available to um, those who are unable to attend. So with that, um, we'll finish up, and I'll pass this back to Melanie. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you to both of our presenters today. Thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. This does conclude the webinar.